your marks. Get set. Go. And we're off giving this another shot. This is the FTP Podcast. We got a bunch of stuff coming your way. Obviously, we'll talk to Mayweather Pacquiao fight a little bit. We got an interview with Jonathan Mincy, cornerback from Auburn, a little bit later. And obviously, we'll talk a little bit more about the NFL draft. Stick around. This, this is the FTP Podcast. Uh, Manny Pacquiao is a tough competitor. He's a true champion at heart. And um, we both was at our best tonight. Was this worth the wait? Um, when, when the history books is written, it was worth the wait. All right. Last night's fight, Mayweather versus Pacquiao. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because, I mean, plain and simple, Floyd won. Uh, it, he, he did what he set out to do. I think if you listen to last week's podcast, um, which if you haven't, you can go back and listen to it and check it out and hear exactly that the plan was all along. There, he was going in there to outclass Manny Pacquiao. And I think hands down, that's what he did. And now you've got, you know, Manny's camp crying foul for saying um, he was winning or he had a shoulder injury and this and that and boo-hoo, boo-hoo. I feel like we hear this every time Floyd wins a fight. There's an excuse after excuse or reasoning after reasoning why he didn't deserve it. But at the end of the day, you stepped in the ring with another grown man and you lost. uh, That's about as complicated as what it boils down to. Floyd won. A unanimous decision. You didn't get one judge, buddy. I mean, plain and simple. I, now, I'm not going to say that it was just a landslide in his direction, but I do think if you watch the fight unbiasedly, he did definitely have the... I mean, he definitely won. If you just watch it unbiasedly, you look at the stats, he won those as well. Plain and simple, I don't think there's any argument to be made for them. Now, they're saying, Manny had a shoulder injury or whatever it may have been, boo-hoo, sound like a personal problem to me. End of the story. All right, let's jump right into the NFL draft because this is going to take a second. Um, there's all kinds of stuff surrounding this. Uh, let, I guess let's go ahead and start with guys that actually got selected. Uh, you know, Jameis Winston heading to Tampa, that's going to be an interesting situation. At the very least, he has some good receivers to go to Mariota in Tennessee. Now, this one, this one threw me for a head scratcher. I had no belief that the Titans were going to keep this pick from plain and simple. It it just made no sense. They are in complete shambles right now. And bringing in a rookie quarterback never necessarily helps that situation. Actually, you can end up (laughs) dramatizing a guy and and never giving him the chance to develop into a a solid quarterback by bringing him into a, a situation that's in shambles like that. But I think this was one of those... We're kind of looking for ownership situations and hoping he's going to be the new face of the franchise things. So uh, I honestly think this was more of a business move than a football move because a football move tells you, you know, if you're trying to win right now and I'm Ken Winters and Hunt, I don't want a rookie quarterback. I I almost want to say I'd have taken Jay Cutler from the Bears who allegedly offered him and went with that because he probably gives you a little bit better of an opportunity to win immediately than Mariota is going to. Not to say that Mariota won't develop into a good player or isn't a good player. I'm just saying immediately. In today's world, head coaches are on the chopping board immediately. All right, those are the top two picks. Let's um, scroll through and just hit on a couple other ones that were a little bit surprising. Let's see, Denver at 23 nabbed up Shane Ray, which was a decent pick for them. Uh, He had gotten arrested for possession of marijuana heading into the draft. And he had the foot injury and a number of other things that ended up sliding his draft stock because when this whole process started, he was probably one of the few consensus top ten picks. So they may have gotten a steal there, and it's kind of funny that, you know, he got arrested for marijuana and now he's going to Colorado. So, hey, whatever works for you, you know what I'm saying? Um, The Jaguars in the second round nabbed up TJ Yeldon, and I'm a huge fan of him. Uh, This guy is the one thing that I never could wrap my head around with Yeldon is if he can run the way he runs from 20 on in the entire time, he would be this phenomenal running back. It's like when he gets to the to the red zone, he becomes a completely different person, a man possessed. He You don't stop him once he gets in the red zone. 
if he ran like that 24-7, he'd be ridiculous. He probably would have been an easy consensus first-round pick. Um, at 12 in the second round, well, actually 44 in the second round, 12th pick in the second round, the Saints pick Kiaha, which for me jumped out as, what are you doing with your lives? Plain and simple. I mean, Kiaha has multiple knee injuries. He is a guy who's not going to win on athletic ability. He's a technique player. And the thing is, a lot of people have taken him off their draft boards for the knee injuries, and then others have dropped him down for the athletic injuries. I mean, the athletic limitations. So more than likely, this is a guy that they could have nabbed up a round or two later. Not to say that I don't like him. I extremely, I, I, he was one of the first guys when I was watching Washington to look at Danny Shelton, Shaq Thompson. I looked at him just off the sheer sack numbers, and you, you got to love his ferocity. You got to love his hand use. You just have to question the, the round and placement of the pick. My personal opinion. One pick I do love is that the Steelers nabbed up Sinquez Golson at 56. That is a good pick. Sinquez is a solid corner. He could be a contributor immediately, not just on special teams, possibly in some subsets. And I think he's a guy who can develop into a little bit, into a pretty good corner. And uh, the only thing that is going to be his one limitation is size. Obviously, he's 5'9". But there, there have been corners around who can and get over that, and he's one of the guys who's smart enough and he plays big enough that I think he could probably uh, supersede his side, his size in some terms. All right, we're gonna take a quick break and then we're gonna take a look at some of the undrafted guys. You are now listening to the FTP podcast. All right, undrafted free agency is definitely built up into one of the, I guess, almost, it's almost its own universe in itself. And a lot of these guys are, are making names for themselves on some teams immediately. And you see guys that just kind of slip through the cracks sometimes. So it it's definitely can be an exciting time. Uh, we talked to Auburn corner Jonathan Mincy, who ended up not getting drafted this weekend. Um, and we just kind of talked to him about his draft process. A lot of people... They don't get to embark on this uh, opportunity that select few like yourself are uh, preparing to do so, which is preparing to in enter the NFL. Now, um, for those who, who are not familiar, of course, you know, you build a body of work from, from, a, from your childhood on up, playing football and whatnot. But what are some of the things you went through as far as preparing physically, also mentally, to make that next step in your career? Uh, really, you... As far as working out and things like that, you have to push yourself because uh, you don't have uh, your coach who you had in college and high school telling you when to work out and how to work out. So uh, what I kind of did was I kind of stayed at uh, Auburn, uh, me and a couple other guys, and we kind of got after it every day and uh, just recently moved back home and started doing the same thing. Um, and as far as just being mentally, you have to put yourself in the mindset to still have that outstanding work ethic and still grind. Uh, and, and know what you're grinding for and really just stay level-headed, being around the right people because one mistake can, can, can take away from the opportunity that you have. Now, when a, when a general manager or a scout say, hey, Jonathan Mincy, what sets you apart from the other 200-plus defensive backs prepared to come to the NFL as well? Really, my versatility, being able to play any defensive back position as well as contributing on special teams and also, under my belt, I, I played over 20-something games in SC. I've never missed a game. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring outstanding work at the end. On top of that, I'm a physical player. Uh, I bring an attitude that you can't, you can't teach. That's something that is just given, and that's something that I pride myself on as well. Of course, everybody prepares. Do you feel that you can, you can come in and to the NFL and contribute right away? Definitely, definitely. Being able... Being able to play in the SEC, I feel any person that can go out there and play in the SEC game in and game out, I feel you can jump right in into the NFL and play just because of the physicality, the speed of the game, speed of the players. And that's, that's another big decision that you make in choosing a school in the SEC. All right, um, a couple other big-name guys that kind of went and fell, seems to have fallen through the cracks. Um, one of the guys was Zach Zinner, a guy we talked a little bit about him on our podcast last week. A uh, guy I really like, he ends up going to Detroit, and I think that could be a good under-the-radar signing for them. Uh, and that could be a future pair for them, a Zach Zinner and Amir Abdullah, at running back who they drafted. 
um, a bigger guy and a smaller guy, Thunder and Lightning. It could be something that could work for them. Another guy that I, I like that ended up going undrafted is Antoine Goodley. He isn't really built like a stereotypical receiver. He's 5'10", 209, and he really just has wheels and, and vertical speed. He can easily be a, a sub-package wide receiver. The question is, where does he fit in outside of that? And I really think he's a guy who uh, he could give cornerback some fits once he catches the ball because, you know, corner, there's a lot of guys that don't really like to tackle in the NFL, and a guy with his size at receiver could probably give them some fits there are going to be some guys that are just going to bounce off of him and not going to want to bring him down. Uh, we'll take one more quick break, and then we'll be right back and close things up. This is Jonathan Mitchell, and you're listening to the FTP Podcast. And I'm still kind of stuck on this draft thing. One more little tidbit, and then I'll kind of hop up off my little nerd soapbox. Uh, Lale Collins, LSU guy, went undrafted in the midst of, you know, police kind of wanting to talk to him about a murder investigation of his ex-girlfriend. Um, timing obviously completely off. I mean, this is, it's completely odd that he was already in Chicago the day before the draft before they mentioned that they wanted to talk to him when she was actually killed the week prior. But I, I think it's it's extremely interesting to me that they've already said that they he's not a suspect. They just kind of want to talk to him because this is a, his ex-girlfriend. He said that he hasn't talked to this girl since September. Um, obviously, it's a sad situation, but as far as the NFL goes, um, he's gone undrafted now. And this is a guy that was almost a consensus first, if not second round pick, uh, regardless, a high level guy. And he's not eligible for the 2016 draft. So he's basically going to sign an undrafted contract with someone once this whole situation resolves itself, and it becomes essentially an extra first-round pick based on recruiting. So now we're going back to the college ranks with this. And uh, not to mention that, especially if he had absolutely no involvement in this situation, it cost him a lot of money and guaranteed, you know, guaranteed money at that, which is somewhat of a problem now obviously there i'm sure we won't hear the end of this i'm sure they'll look into some things before he does sign with any team and i'm sure he'll pick the best situation but there are limitations on the contracts that undrafted guys can get and obviously it's nowhere near the money that a first round pick or even a second round pick can get which like i said it cost them some money and it, it brings up the point of now we're going to get into this recruiting ball game of well where is he going to go Especially if there was no wrongdoing on his part, this was merely a woman that he used to associate with and something happened to her and he had no involvement in it. This is a sad situation and obviously he's in a rough place and obviously our condolences go out to that female's family. But if he had no involvement in it, obviously I'm sending some condolences to him too and his wallet because I'm... It's rough, but some NFL team's going to luck up here and end up with it, basically an extra first-round pick and a guy and easily have the best draft class on on the simple fact of they were able to go back and recruit Lele Cotlin. Mm, plain and simple. All right, well, we're wrapping things up now, and uh, let's take a look at today in sports history. On May 3rd, 1936, Joe DiMaggio made his major league debut. He got three hits that day. All right, that'll about do it for things today. Uh, we'll be back next week. If you want to check out our last podcast, it's on youtube.com slash from the press box. And you can take a look at some of our seal of approvals we did. Some of a couple of guys that we just kind of take a look at in the draft. Not necessarily your Jameis Winston's of the world. But still solid guys in my opinion. All right. Well.